to Mr. Biz Radio, Biz Talk for Biz Owners. If you're ready to stop faking the funk and take your business onward and upward, this show is for you. And now, here's Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Mr. Biz Radio with me, Mr. Biz, Ken Wentworth. And uh, we're going to talk about something this week that I think is probably a little counterintuitive to, to a lot of people that have been listening to the show a lot of times because, you know, especially in the entrepreneur world, we're always hearing influencers talk about the hustle, the grind, all that kind of stuff. You know, you got to work hard and you hear some people talking about, you know, the counters of working, you know, 16, 18 hours for the first, you know, how many years to get things going. And then, and then, you know, what's work-life balance. You hear all these things about the hustle and the grind and everything. We're actually going to talk about or with our guest this week about the power, get this, the power of doing less. Now, what the heck does that mean? Okay, so we're going to get into this. our guest this week when he's not battling needless complexity. Georg Meyer thinks, speaks, and writes about beautiful life-serving systems and organizations. In the past two decades, he has been an executive at a publicly traded company in a one-man show, an academic, and a practitioner, a software developer, and a management consultant. He has driven a forklift and designed a warehouse. He has built software and been its own end user. Yeah, has worked in the energy, finance, health, retail, and manufacturing industries, and currently serves as a board member for family businesses on topics of culture, strategy, and technology. And he holds a PhD in information and decision sciences from the University of Minnesota. Georg, welcome to Mr. Biz Radio. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Yeah, so uh, fascinating background. Uh, I'm really curious to hear, you know, sort of your journey overall, your entrepreneurial journey. I mean, you've you've taken all these different stops, as I mentioned in the intro here. You know, what's what's your journey been like? Um, yeah, so I started. I grew up in Switzerland. You know, did normally high school. Then at the time, I was very interested in computers. I started studying computer science at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology which is the leading technical university. And after two semesters, I realized that really was not for me. Like it seemed, you know, it seemed very theoretical. It seemed complicated. And I decided to drop out of college. And I thought, I really want to get a job as a coder. So as you can imagine, like that is not the most popular profile for like companies trying to hire somebody as a software developer. So I probably had to apply to like 60 jobs to end up getting like five interviews and two offers, but it worked out. And so I ended up getting my first gig at actually the shell company. And after that, I got another gig a year later for a Swiss company that expanded into the US. And with them, I had the chance to move over to US and work, um, work for them. So they acquired a few businesses and I got to work on integrations and I got to really learn about different culture, learn about processes and still do quite a bit of work in software. And then at that time it came up that, oh, you know, I, I probably really should go back for the education part. And <laughs> I managed to, managed to do a bachelor, mostly remote at Excelsior College and then get a master's at Iowa State. And that life has these funny turns and my advisor said, well, you should think about getting a PhD. And I, I didn't have anything really planned. So it's like, well, it's, it seems interesting. And I went to University of Minnesota, mainly because the name information decision sciences really appealed to me. And so that's very, it's an area like the intersection of psychology, economics, and computer science. On the first day there, I met my wife. On the last <laughs> okay. day, we got married. <laughs> and by then, I had a job offer to work as a management consultant for McKinsey and Company if we moved back to Switzerland. So we got married and two weeks later, we were on the plane with our three cats moving to Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, and then from there on, then I did management consulting for a big company for two years. And then I really wanted to strike out on my own with everything I've learned. And that's what I did. I had a, an independent consulting firm helping companies improve processes, you know, work with technology. Like I, I like to say, I tried to bring together people, process and technology. Then the opportunity presented itself to take a role as a CIO for a publicly traded company in Switzerland. So I got to do that for kind of a turnaround situation, um, helping to bring a really big project home. But I felt like a, after a couple of years, it really pulled me back into the independent consulting work, like the, the entrepreneurial spirit 
it's hard to to get rid of <laughs> yeah for sure so yeah so here i am now back in consulting and really trying to do like you said at the beginning the focus on what's essential right don't i feel that the world is very complex and we do a lot of things but they're not necessarily always the ones that we should be doing yeah i'm, I'm very curious to talk actually Gary, because you know uh i think you know again like i mentioned uh during the intro and everything i mean that's all you hear about is the hustle, the grind, work, work, work. And I feel like I know I'm guilty of it sometimes and I try to watch myself, but I know that I'm guilty of it sometimes is being busy, but not productive, right? You get to the end of the day and you're like, man, I worked my butt off today. And then there's sometimes I look back and I go, you know, the next day, maybe I'll get up and I'll, you know, be working through stuff. Or usually what I do is I'll plan my next day the evening before. And so I'm looking when I'm planning and I'm like, wait a minute, why do I? Why, why is that still on my list? Like I, I worked on that today. Well, I worked on it, but I was, it was busy work essentially, you know, it wasn't, well, I wasn't productive. And so I think I'm very curious as we get into our conversation here to hear some of your thoughts around this. Obviously you've worked in a bunch of different industries. You've got the academic experience, you've got the the practical experience as well. So I'm, I'm very curious to hear about that, but I guess, you know, one question I want to ask you, Georg is, you know, based on your experience and everything and, you know, kudos for going back to school and everything. A lot of people you know, stop going to school and just never go back or whatever. And, you know, for some people that works, um, but it sounds like, you know, it was pretty rewarding for you. And, you, and if nothing else, you met your wife. So that, that was good. <laughs> yep. But, you know, coming, coming through that, what are some resources that have been really valuable for you? Um, so funny enough for the education. So, you know, I've, I've always been very driven to like try and optimize things. So when I looked at a bachelor, like I, did you know basically internet research and looked at like you know what are the what are the most efficient ways to doing that and there i learned like colleges will give you a lot of credit for like life experience right like it's called the clep so you can basically most colleges like test out of a year of college with stuff you've already done so if the if that degree is your goal like that's one way you know to really save a bunch of time like you study up a few nights and you can take that test Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, that obviously probably saves you some money too, right? And you're taking less classes. Yeah. I'm sure the testing out costs you something, but certainly not as much as actually taking the class. Yeah. The test was, I think at that time it was 80 bucks. And then if you compare that to tuition for a year, it's very great return. Yeah. Yeah. So were you able yeah. to test out of a good bit of classes then? For um, yeah. For, for my bachelor's, most of it, like I managed to complete it under a year. And that's Excelsior College kind of has a special setup that allows you to do that. Most colleges let you test out of 30 credits, so one year. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I, and I've heard of that. And I actually, geez, a million years ago when I was doing my undergrad, I, I think I tested out of one class. Um, same thing. It was significantly cheaper as well, um, which for, back then was a, was a big deal for me. Um, keeping those costs down. I was going to a private school and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm racking up student debt and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, that was important. Well, I, I'll tell you what, Gay, we're, we're going to hit a break here. Um, guys, go out and we'll put this in the show notes, but um, you can go out to uh, Georg's website, georgmeyer.com. Follow him on Twitter and on LinkedIn. You can find him, Georg Meyer. Again, we'll put these in the show notes as well. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to hit a break, we'll come back with the Mr. Biz tip of the week. And, and then we're going to dive into a little bit more of what Georg's doing now, how he helps people, um, and, and things like that. And of course, we're going to dive into how the power of doing less. If you would like to reach hundreds of thousands of business owners every week, Mr. Biz Radio can help. Our show airs globally seven days a week for more than 25 hours across several internet radio stations plus 20 plus podcast platforms. Also, video exposure on the new exclusive Mr. Biz Network streaming channel which gets blasted to 100 plus streaming platforms and the Mr. Biz YouTube channel and our 350,000 social media followers multiple times every week. Join Mr. Biz Nation as an advertiser by emailing us at info at MrBizSolutions.com. Are you ready to automate your business? Automation is the key to scaling a business and building wealth. It's also one of the most difficult things for a small business owner to do on their own. If you're looking for help with automation, Pulse Technology CRM can help. We have an exclusive offer for Mr. Biz Nation. We will build everything for free, even if it's a sophisticated funnel. 
Visit thepulsespot.com forward slash Mr. Biz for this exclusive offer. Got a question for Mr. Biz you want answered on air? Email it to info at mrbizsolutions.com. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show, and it is time for the Mr. Biz tip of the week. And uh, this one, you know, I've shared this this tip uh, for several years now. I think it's an important one. I get asked the question very often about, uh, number one, what should I be spending? You know, what small business owners should be spending on marketing and things like that. But even aside from that, talking about what you should expect from that marketing. Um, and what I always say, and some of my marketing friends, they, they, they kick and scream when they hear me say this, but I, I say you should expect to have a 300% return on any marketing dollars you're, you're spending. And again, my marketing friends are like, whoa, don't pe- tell people that. But, but I think it's very important to, to set those expectations. And more importantly, if you set that as your benchmark, and, and what I mean by that is if you're spending 100 bucks on marketing, you should see $300 of revenue from that. And I think if you set that benchmark, it's important to take a look at where you're spending those marketing dollars to ensure that you're getting that return. And it, man, it's such a powerful impact on a business when you are able to look at those things and look at the returns, specific returns you're getting on the different marketing spends you have, and then taking the money away from the things that aren't returning 3X and putting them towards you know adding more fuel to the fire, so to speak, to the ones that are working. And man, the impact it has, uh, the acceleration impact it has on a business is just tremendous. So that is the tip of the week. Expect a 300% market, uh, uh, market, uh, marketing return on your dollars. If you're not getting that, either get a new plan or fire your marketer. <laughs> so that is the Mr. Biz tip of the week this week. Uh, we're going to get back in and talking to Georg Meyer. So Georg, um, you know, we heard a little about your journey in the first segment. Tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, kind of some of the things you're doing now and how you help, help folks now. Sure. Yeah. So now I'm a consultant. I'm basically a problem solver. And I think what is kind of my specialty is, if, you know, you can look at a business as people, process, and technology. And it's usually pretty easy to find a consultant that will, like, help you with one of these areas. I think how I help businesses by like, integrating that view, you know, because you, you need all three to work well together. Right? You design your processes for your people. You want your technology to empower your people and you have to take care of them. And so I, what I try to help businesses is to do exactly this, the power of doing less. Right? I, I really try to come and find what's the essence of that problem that we're trying to solve and to help really articulate that because it's often we struggle with a problem just because we, we haven't expressed it in the right way yet. Like some, you know, oft, uh, it's especially in technology, you often see people ask for a solution before they really started understanding what the problem is. And then what I really like to do is to prototype, right? I think you have an idea of like, what could we solve? And let's build something. Let's build the simplest possible version of that and see if that really works, like test it against reality. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the things that I think is very fascinating because honestly, We've been doing the show for six and a half years now. We've never had anyone on with your background and experience that integrates all three of those things. And I, I think you're right. I mean, I saw it when I worked in the corporate world where, you know, they develop a new whiz bang technology solution, but the integration of it was poor or the training for it was poor. And so then it could have been the system that had would have a massive, you know, positive impact on the organization, but because the rollout and integration didn't go so well, and so people didn't embrace it. And then of course, you know, you see the people side of it, of people start complaining, you know, we like the old system and we, we, what was wrong with that? And I knew how to do it in that system and I have to learn it in this one. I gotta tell you, Georg, I hear it from my mom. My mom, my mom's still working. Um, she's kind of, she's a nurse, but she's kind of a tele-nurse. And so they're always developing new systems. And so I, I, almost every weekend when we talk, she's like, oh, we got a new thing in our system. And, you know, she's kind of that old dog being taught a new trick and she, you know, sometimes doesn't like it. So what are some of the things that you see with that, with a new technology platform, with a new technology solution and and how to best integrate that with people and get people to be really good users of it? Yeah. So first I can say, I can really relate to your mom because I always, I feel I'm very conservative in that sense that I get frustrated when, oh, there's another update and now they move this button and I can't find it, right? Like it eats into productivity and you figure that happens times, you know, a hundred million people. So um, for me, like in all projects, like it's, it's really important that people 
are bought in as much as possible from the beginning, right? So it, it's very worthwhile that you involve people before you make the changes and you explain it and they have a chance to voice their opinion. You know, they, they may ask for, oh, could it do this and that? And I found even if the answer is no, like they appreciate the fact that they were involved in the process and they've seen the thinking of like, why are we even doing this? Because yeah, it seems like a lot of the times, right? You put in a new solution and people are like, well, what was wrong with the old one? Yeah, I, I can tell you one of the things that um, I utilized in my corporate career at one point was after banging my head against the proverbial wall a couple of times and, and having some difficulties with some, with some integrations is, is coming up and working with the technology team on what the new solution was going to look like. And just like you were talking about, basically like a prototype and then getting everyone together and saying, this is the base model of what we're looking to do. Tell me what about the current system frustrates you. And let's see if we can integrate that into the new system. Because then right away, like you're talking about, people go, oh my gosh, this is going to solve. I love the old system, but man, these two things I have to do are a huge pain in my neck. If this new system will solve it. So that you get buy-in, like you're saying, right off the bat. And they go, oh my gosh, this system is going to be great. So that, that whole mentality thing from the start, instead of the, oh my gosh, I got to learn something new, this stinks. You know, it gives them that, I, I think, you know, a little positive momentum going into it. Yep. No, and I think this is for, you know, as your business gets larger, if you have large projects, right, like the investment in the change management really has the biggest return. Because like you said, you could spend 20 million on a new system and for an additional million in change management, you would actually get the return and people would use it to the max, or you can just have a new system and everyone's frustrated and try to resist. Yeah, I, I, like I said, the, the couple of times that, you know, unsuccessful or, or not as successful integrations of, you know, we had literally a, a, a person in our department, you know, we developed a system, we put a ton of work in, into it. We worked a bunch of extra to, 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 enter, to get it going quicker and all that kind of stuff. And one of the people that was the most productive previously under the old system, you know, we get 90 days into it and his productivity had gone down significantly and he wasn't producing results. And, you know, I sat down, had a one-on-one -on -one with him. I said, you know, Josh, what's, what's going on here, Pete? Like what, you know, well, then I come to find out, Georg, he, started to use the new system, didn't like it, got frustrated, couldn't figure something out and just said the heck with it. The old system was gone. So he was like using Excel. He like, he tried to just do himself in Excel, which was completely inefficient. So, you know, it was bogging him down. And instead of raising his hand and saying, Hey, I need more training. I need something. He just decided to go off on his own. And it was, you know, was terrible. Uh, we had to get him sort of uh, out of that mindset. And then he was, he had been around the department a, a, a quite a bit of time. So he had the ear of a lot of people. So he was kind of bogging everything down because he was doing a lot of complaining about the system, frankly. So it, it was, it was a, it was a challenging situation for sure. I'm sure you've run into things like that uh, in your, in your past. Um, yeah. So I learned because I started in a software development. So I, I came with the engineering mindset of like, Oh, I have the perfectly logical solution. And then I would implement software and then, People didn't use it. It's like, well, I don't get why. It just makes rational sense, right? And then, then I learned that there's also the psychology part to humans, and that's the you know even more important part if you want to get through something like that. And it's, I really started to appreciate that as an as an engineer, you have to understand who you're building for, right? You have to know the customer. So I did a project to design a warehouse at a small family business, and then I love the owner there. He's been a great mentor for me, and he let me work in the warehouse, like as a, back then an IT guy, you know, it's like, Hey, that's how I ended up on the forklift. And like, I got to do all the processes, got to do all the people who work in the warehouse. And then I really understood that just because it looks great on paper, doesn't help you if you have a pallet that has to be raised like 25 feet in the air and put away. Yeah. And I think that's important too, is that the people that are designing the system or the layout or whatever it might be, you know, to, to really roll your sleeves up and get involved. So you see some of those things that are impacts that again, on paper, you don't see that. Like there's a weight limit on the pallet. Like we can't have a pallet over 10 feet that weighs over X or whatever on a piece of paper. You don't see that. So again, this week, guys, we're talking with Georg Meyer. We'll put his website and his uh, socials in the show notes. We're going to come back and talk about the power of doing less. How would you like to have direct access to Mr. Biz to help you run your business more profitably and more efficiently? At MrBizSolutions.com, you get live access to not only Mr. Biz, but also several of his hand-picked and trusted business experts, each with 20-plus years of experience. 
to help you optimally manage and grow your business. That's just the start of where Mr. Biz Solutions begins. Learn more at MrBizSolutions.com. That's MrBizSolutions.com. Business owners have a continually growing to-do list with little time for revenue-producing activities. With Check Off Your List and their experienced team of virtual assistants, you can focus on growing your business. Visit CheckOffYourList.com to learn how Check Off Your List skilled team can handle your day-to-day tasks like social media, bookkeeping, calendar maintenance, and much more. Contact Check Off Your List at CheckOffYourList.com or call 888-262-1249 to see how their virtual assistants can help you live to work rather than work to live. Check out all three of Mr. Biz's best-selling books at MrBizBooks.com. Now, once again, here's Mr. Biz. All right, welcome back to the show, and it's time it's time to hit pay dirt here. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the power of doing less. So, so I know this is one of your sort of your tenants, uh, Georg. I know you know doing show uh, research for the show and checking out your website and some of your social media uh, content, et cetera. And from having you know connected with you earlier several months back, you know I know this is one of your tenants, and it's one of the things I wanted to dive into. So, tell us, you know, what's what's your definition of that, and 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 what does that look like? The power of doing less. Yeah. So for me, it's really focus on the essential and, you know, get rid of everything else that is superfluous. So it really means, yeah, don't, don't just do things because we're so used to doing things, right? Because that's how you always get more added on, but have a, have a strong sense of intention and like, you know, do the things you do, do them well. And yeah, try, try to stay away from everything else. And if, if you think about this from a business sense, you know, it's kind of like if you look outside it, what does your customer actually see, right? Where's actual value created for your customer? And if you can't answer that, if you don't see that, then is it an activity that's really worth doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that's very important. And, and you know, I, I look at it as almost um, as I was thinking this through, you know, when I was doing uh, uh, preparation for the show and thinking through some of this stuff and then seeing stuff on your website is, Tell me if I'm way off on this. The analogy I was thinking of, Georg, was more like uh, someone, not not someone who's a hoarder, but someone who keeps a lot of stuff, right? And they go, I'm going to, I might need this someday. And they keep, you know, they, I just went through a whole purging, you know, in my, in my home office and got rid of so much stuff that I had, for some reason, got stuck in my head. Well, I might need this someday. I might need this someday. And I'm certainly no hoarder. And I, I keep things very neat and everything, but I had, I had held on to so many things that I just did not need. And I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading what you're saying correctly is, you know, that's what we do and we have processes and we continue to add on a little here and a little there. And over years, you, you end up with a lot of superfluous activities that really don't add to the essentialness of what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, exactly. Like that's a great example you just had with the hoarding, right? Like, because you, you're not trying to hoard, but you hold on because it's driven by this fear that, oh, well, maybe one day I would need this. <laughs> and you imagine, right? Like you would be able to find it in all the other stuff that is around. Right. And, and of course, like it happened that one time, right, that you threw something away and then a week later you needed it. And so that's, you know, your mind weighs that much heavier than like the 99 other things you threw away that you never thought about again. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very important. And I think, you know, I've gone through this with a process uh, years ago and we literally walked through this entire process and really wrote down keystroke by keystroke, everything. And then we said, okay, and, and I'm oversimplifying, but we basically went through and said, what would happen if we didn't do this step? What blows up? Does anything blow up? What if, we, what if this step, we didn't do it? Can we take these five out? You know, and just kind of went step by step. And again, I'm making it, you know, oversimplifying and make it more tedious than it actually was. But it's very eye-opening, especially when you have a process that's been around for quite some time and been passed from person to person and things like that of all the things that end up being non-essential that it becomes that, oh my gosh, I hate when people say it, but that's the way we've always done it, you know? Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely right. Like you you see the history in almost everything. And especially nowadays, right? When the world changes so quickly, like the history for a process may be completely different. It was built for a completely different environment. And I think, so one of the, one of the things I really like doing is clean sheeting, right? Instead of looking at the existing process, try to come up with the, the dream state, right? Like think, hey, if, how, how, we, how would we want this to work if we could make it from scratch? And often that's very revealing because then you see actually 
you know, it's, it's much more realistic than we would have originally imagined. Yeah, actually, I would think uh, now that you say that, that's probably a way more efficient process than what I had mentioned, because not only do you come up with some new ideas, but, you know, I, and I've heard um, uh, Sarah Blakely say this, uh, the woman who founded Spanx, and she said, what she always asks employees is, how would you do your job if no one told you how to do it? And it sounds like that's very, it kind of ties into exactly what you just mentioned. Yeah, I, I think these are all really great questions. Also the one that you had, you know, when you reviewed the process, right? Like what breaks if I stop doing this? And all too often the answer is nothing. Right. It's, and again, in, in software, like sometimes you find these because, you know, there's a feature in the software and it actually, it doesn't work. And like six months later, somebody calls and says, oh, I clicked on it and it doesn't work. And it's like, okay, it, it didn't work for six months and nobody noticed. So that right. should tell us something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious as you as you work through, you know, those the people process and technology and you're making things efficient and everything, there's got to be a couple one or two things at least that are like big pet peeves of yours that you see with when when with those three together. What are some of those things for you, Georg? Um so yeah, I, <laughs> I mean for for me I I'm really driven by I really don't like to see waste, right? So that's that's kind of what brings it all together for me and things that make life harder. So you read at the beginning, you know, the, I, I care, like I want things to be human friendly and life serving. And I think especially in technology, it often goes the wrong way because everything, we just add more features, we make it more complicated. So one of my pet peeves is, you know, nowadays you can't open a new computer and not end up with like the news in your face. And it's like, you know, is that really helpful? Because now everyone's distracted by something that's happening far away in the world, as opposed to what they're supposed to do. And so that's kind of my biggest pet peeve is just like putting in these roadblocks for people to get to do what they want to do and what they're good at. So what would you say, Georg, to someone? And so other than, I know you had mentioned before of like clean slating something and saying, hey, how could we do this? What's another step that maybe a business owner that has a process that they're thinking as they're listening or watching the show right now saying, gosh, I really need to take a look at this. What, what's like another piece of advice you would give them on how to, how to really dive into that to, 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 to make it more efficient? Um, so I, I think one, one good thing is look, look for the drudgery, right? Like it's usually the work that nobody likes doing that, you know, that is also not really value adding. So that's, that's usually a good way to identify a problem area. And then it is, like I said earlier, right? Like keep the end in mind, like look at what is actually the output of this process and does it really benefit the customer or employees or whoever this process is for? Got it, and yeah. Then, Go ahead, I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, and another thing that I also like is we often forget that sometimes we think just because something is a big problem, it requires a big solution and often that's a false belief because there's, like you said, every company you see, right? Like people always use Excel on the side of whatever system it has. And it's like, <laughs> sometimes Excel actually is the right solution because you can't make a system as flexible as that. It's only when it really becomes repeatable, right? That you want it, you want to be sure like there is a standard and a system that helps people be efficient. Yeah, and I think, you know, things have come a long way and technology, you know, way, way better than I do. I mean, th things are changing so often. I think a big thing for me that I've seen, even, you know, outside of some of the things that, you know, people process and technology is just, I, I think the big battle, and we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, is really on the people side is making sure you go into it the right way and that people get the right mindset to start with. We're not trying to take over your job. We're not going to eliminate your job if we make this more efficient. We're going to have, we'll be able to do more cool stuff. Stuff, you know, we're going to get rid of some of the drudgery and we're going to get, have you doing some things that are more meaningful to you and more fulfilling. And instead of people saying, oh my gosh, if we make this too efficient, they're going to get rid of me or I'm going to lose my job or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think it's oh. common. I, I think that's right. That's a big part of leadership. That, that's where the articulation comes in. It's really, you have to explain the why. You know, there's this quote that says, if people have a why, they can endure almost any how. And with, with that mindset, you get really far. And I like to say technology and policy, right, are no substitutes for leadership. Like really, that's the part you have to do. And then you can cultivate that mindset and get people to adopt the technology into processes. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, Gabe, great information. Really loved it. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah, we'll, we'll put every, all the, his contact information